Chapter 12, On Fire, Frank. What is it? Joe demanded. I reached under my pillow and pulled out a folded sheet of paper. I opened it and read the message aloud. Check stench house. Joe snatched the note away. No signature. He flipped the paper over just to double check, but at least someone is on our side. Maybe, I answered. Joe makes decisions quickly. I, I like to have more time to think. You think it could be a setup? I think the only person I trust in this place is you, I told my brother. We have to, to get a look in Stench's house, possible setup or not. Joe refolded the note and handed it back to me. The one building with, the, with a lock and no windows is definitely the place to keep information on a secret plan. Yep. You brought the lock, you brought the lock picks, right? Joe reached for the backpack. They're in here, but I have a feeling Mondo's going to be watching us. I answered. We're going to have to choose our time carefully. If only Stench hadn't dragged us on that mission today, Joe complained. With him and Mondo gone, it would have been the perfect time for a little breaking and entering. I've been thinking about that. I bet Stench brings every newbie on a mission as soon as possible, I said, to make sure they're his kind of people, or to turn them into his kind of people, Joe suggested. I still feel slimy about today. We didn't really do anything. But it feels like we did, I finished for him. We waited out the siesta time. If Mondo was keeping an eye on us, I wanted him to see that we were following his instructions. But as soon as the hour was up, Joe and I headed back out into the compound. I did a Mondo scan. Didn't see him anywhere. Petal, however, hurried right up. Had she been watching our tent? Had someone asked her to? Mondo? It seemed strange that she was on us. The second we stepped out of the tent, Joe here, I have to step in because Frank is out, out of it. It's not weird at all that Petal came right up to us. Of course she was watching our tent. She wanted more Frank time. Do you understand, Frank? The girl likes you. Go away, Joe. I'm telling the story. Okay, maybe Joe's right. Maybe Petal was hanging around because she wanted to accidentally on purpose run into me. See my famous blush, hear my stammer like Elmer Fudd, whatever. I'm on my way to do a little more target practice, Petal waved her bow. Want to come? Sure, I said. Joe looked at me in surprise, but I figured we needed to get a sense of Stench's routine. That way, we'd know we should make an attempt to search his house. Why not use Petal to get some info? Have you ever tried archery? Petal asked as she led the way over to the bales of hay she used as targets. Only a couple of times, Joe answered. We're more track and field guys. That's cool, Petal stopped about 30 yards from the, from the target. A bullet will go about 100 yards without any drop in trajectory. An arrow starts dropping a lot faster. That's something to keep in mind when you're aiming. Joe raised his eyebrows. Why was this girl talking about bullets? How much did she know about firearms and why? Just another hobby? Petal handed me her bow. She moved close behind me and practically hugged me as she helped me position the arrow. Get a room, Joe joked. <laughs> Not funny. He thinks I have no sense of humor. <laughs> what he doesn't think, get is that a lot of the time he's not funny. <laughs> I wish I could, Petal answered. She grinned. I wouldn't mind giving up a tent for an actual room. Stench only believes in rooms for himself, I asked. Petal stepped away. Go, she said, not smiling anymore. I let the arrow fly. It hit the hay, at least. Mr. Stench has a lot of demands on his time, Petal told me, her cool, her voice cool. She, he needs more privacy than the rest of us. Right, it's a thinkatorium, Joe said. He held out his hand for the, for the bow. I gave it to him. Any tips? He asked Petal. Aim and shoot, she told him. No hugging, <laughs> no hugging for Joe. He should be grateful. <laughs> Mr. Stench really does get the best ideas in there, Petal said, once Joe's arrow had landed. Landed closer to the center of the bale of hay than mine had. He's in there right now, Petal continued. Sometimes, once he's inside, we won't see him for days. But when he comes out, he always has a million new plans. For pain and destruction, I silently added. Days, huh? Joe asked. Sometimes days. Not always, Petal said. Your turn, Alex. She took the bow from Joe and handed it to me. Then she got her arms wrapped around me again. Did I mention Alex is one of my favorite names? She asked just as I let the, bow, the, the arrow fly. It, <laughs> it missed the target entirely. Petal laughed, <laughs> but not in a mean way. 
I reminded myself that she's been hurling pain on people a few hours ago. I couldn't trust her. I suddenly spotted Dave pushing a wheelbarrow of what looked like vegetable peelings. Need some help? I asked. I was ready to get away from Petal. Sure, Dave answered. I'm going to add this to com the compost heap, then do some weeding in the garden. Perfect. The garden had a clear view of Stench's house. If he came out, Joe and I would know about it. We waited until the sun started going down, but the door to Stench's windowless house stayed shut. Mondo left once and came back with a couple of pineapples, snack on, or sword practice. That's it. When it got dark, the compound shut down. That's the way it is when you live in a place with limited electricity. Solar Man could only do so much. Joe and I headed back to our tent. The sun had gotten to me again. I knew Joe was saying something, but I couldn't keep my eyes open. I fell into a dream. I was back in the lawyer's office where Joe and I had had our last mission, but Joe wasn't with me. Petal was. In the dream, it was easy to talk to her, and in the dream, I didn't suspect her of anything. Do you smell smoke? Petal asked. I told her not to worry about it. Yeah, the building was on fire, but we could just rappel down, and it was only a dream. One of those dreams where you kind of know it's a dream. I started to cough, which was weird. I mean... There was smoke in the office, but it was a dream smoke, and I knew that. that. Wake up, I told myself. This is annoying. <laughs> Don't you wish you could channel surf in your dreams? But no, I was stuck in this one. The place is on fire, Petal exclaimed, but her voice came out sounding like Joe's. Wake up, Frank, Joe shouted. The tent is on fire. My eyes snapped open. This was no dream. Flames covered the ceiling of the tent. Chapter 13, Payback. Joe. Frank and I grabbed our packs. As I stumbled out of the tent, a motorcycle almost ran over my toes. Beefy was on the back. Go back where you belong, hippie, he howled. He splashed gas on the tent next to ours as he zoomed past. Scrawny was right behind him. Without slowing his breakdown, he torched a torch to the gas splattered canvas. Womp! A fireball exploded. A bearded man raced out of the tent and started after Beefy and Scrawny. So did Frank and I. Helpless. We didn't have our bikes. We didn't even have a garden hose to turn on the tents. Bucket Brigade, Frank cried. I tried to remember how much water was produced in Janet's lab. Didn't matter. We had to try something. There are some buckets behind the dining hall, the bearded man shouted. The three of us raced toward the dining hall. I couldn't see much, just flashes lit, lit, lit by headlights or flashlights or torches. A jeep zigzagged through the garden, tearing up the crops. Redface ran past on foot. He used a knife to slash one of the tents as he went. This is payback, he screamed. You thought you got away, but we followed you. You're going down, freaks. A stink bomb hit Frank on the back of the neck. I didn't even see where it came from. Get out of here, a man shouted as he used a baseball bat to smash the magnifying glasses of the stove. A teenage girl behind the wheel of a beat-up convertible backed over two of the compound bicycles. She blew me a kiss as I tore up by her. And then it was over. There must have been a signal, but I missed it. The shouts stopped. The motorcycles and vehicles roared off. The sound of my own heartbeat filled my ears as we retrieved the buckets and filled them with water. But it was too late. There was nothing left of our tent to save, nothing left of our neighbors. As the sun began to come up, Frank and I wandered through the compound, joining with the others in a sad, silent parade as we took in the destruction. Everyone to the garden. Stench's voice filled the compound. He spoke through the megaphone again. Everyone to the garden immediately. It didn't take long for everyone in the community to gather. I stared at the tire tracks running across the neat rows of vegetables, smashed vegetables. How long would it take to repair the damage that had been done in less than half an hour? We all formed a circle around Stench. He dropped the megaphone. Now, first things first, was anyone hurt? There was a bunch of no's and head shakes. Stench nodded. So they stuck to property damage, he began to pace. Can anyone tell me why you think we were attacked tonight? I thought it was pretty obvious. Payback, like Red Face had yelled. We'd attacked people in the town. People in the town attacked us. Of course, I didn't say that. I was supposed to seem like a good little stench follower. Nobody else said anything either. I guess everybody knew stench liked to answer his own questions. Oil, stench said. Huh? 
The oil companies have been out here to get me ever since I started Heaven, Stench continued. They know if we succeed in our mission to create alternative energy sources, they will be out of business. Stench pulled his sword free from its scabbard. Now, it may look it may have looked like it was just a few hotheads from town who did this to us, but the oil companies were behind it. Oil company dollars. Swish, swish, the sword cut through the air. Yes, they're out to get us, he pointed the sword at Solar Man. Out to get you, my brother, because they know your way works. Yes, Solar Man's panels clacked, clanked as he thrust his fist into the air. Out to get you, Stench pointed his sword at Einstein wannabe, because they're afraid of the very idea of geothermal. Einstein wannabe nodded, his wild hair getting even wilder. They trembled at the very word hydroelectricity, Stench said to the man dressed in the long robe, identical to Stench's, the one who had been praising hydroelectricity at lunch. Man, Stench was a genius. He was stroking egos like crazy, making everyone feel so important. Those oil companies think all they have to do is pay off a few townies to take care of us. Stench brought his sword to his forehead and sighed. They think they are so smart. We are all MBAs and scientists working for them. Stench spun in a fast circle. But I say that there is no one working at those, at one of those fat cat oil companies who is smarter than any one of you. Applause burst out in a circle. I say the oil company's reign of terror is about to come to an end. We aren't going to take this from them, are we? Stench's eyes blazed. No, everyone in the circle yelled. I mouthed the words. I couldn't bring myself to become part of the mob. I think Frank did the same. Are we going to make him pay? Stench bellowed. Yes, the crowd shouted back, smiles on every face. You're darn right we are. Tonight at midnight is payback time, Stench exclaimed. Be ready because we are going into town. Cheers, screams, applause. My stomach churned. <laughs> Maybe this would be a good thing. I pulled Frank aside. This is it, our shot. They go into town, we go into Stench's house. I glanced over at the building. It had escaped the torches. It is the perfect time, Frank agreed, but we have to go into town with Stench. You heard how furious he is. If he gets too out of control, we have to be there to stop it. Tonight's not his big plan, I argued. He didn't know this attack was coming. He'll probably just do something like the paint again. We can't know that, Joe. But we have to risk it. We have to find out what his big plan is. If we don't, we might not be able to put an end to it. Frank didn't look convinced. What if he was going to put the big plan in motion tonight? What if he decided to move up the schedule because of what happened? He had a point. How about this? We know that the copter without the controls has, has, uh, is, is a part of his plan. It has to be, right? You don't have a thing like that just sitting around. Agreed. So tonight, we hide out in the tent with the copter. We don't want to be in sight when Stench and the others leave for town anyway, I said. But if Stench is putting the big plan in motion, we'll know. Frank agreed, because somebody will come for the helicopter. Right. We slid under the back of the helicopter tent just after sundown. We figured it was the it was better to be hiding, hidden away early. My biggest problem was trying not to doze off, sitting there in the dark and everything. But that stopped being a problem when somebody grabbed me by the back of the neck. Did I mention how quiet Mondo can be? He looked from me to Frank. Mr. Stench honors the honor, requests the honor of your presence. Frank, chapter 14, The Fuse. Mondo marched us over to the van and shoved us inside. Pedal, the guy Joe had named Einstein wannabe, and Solar Man were already in place. You're late, Stench said from the driver's seat. I said midnight. I waited for Mondo to tell Stench where, where he'd found us. He didn't. Did that mean the copter was a secret? Stench seemed to keep a lot of secrets from his followers. Lateness shows a lack of attention to detail, Stench continued as we started down the road through the desert. The solar panels had clearly stored up plenty of energy during the, the daylight hours. We were going at least 70. That can be deadly in our missions, Stench's voice filled every corner of the van. Sorry, Joe muttered. One mistake and someone could die tonight. Got it? I said. Got it, I said. It definitely didn't sound like we were going to do any more paint splattering, and that thought was confirmed by the absence of paint cans, and something else was different from the last trip to town, something besides Dave being replaced by Einstein wannabe. The van was bumping and jerking like last time. Pedal had managed to get herself situated tight against me. Mondo had shotgun again. 
Stench was driving. What was it? The inside of my brain started to itch. Whatever it was, it was important. I looked over at Joe. He signed one word to me, gas. That was it. The inside of the van reeked of gas and the van ran on solar panel, on solar power. Something was very wrong. I scanned the vehicle, trying to figure out the source of the gas fumes. I caught Stench watching me in the rearview mirror. No paint tonight, I asked. I tried to sound eager, like I was looking forward to whatever was coming. Don't need it, Stench answered. His smile turned my spine to ice. What is our mission tonight, Joe asked. I'm sorry we were late. We didn't get to hear it. Stench's smile must just grew wider in reply. Mr. Stench gives us information on a need-to-know basis, Pedal said into my ear. He doesn't really like questions. A leader who expected his followers to obey without asking questions. I flashed for a moment on those facts, on those faces I'd seen on Mount Rushmore. Our country was founded on debate. Did Stench know that? If he did, he obviously didn't care. The muscles in my back and shoulders and even my jaw tightened as the van rolled into town. I felt pedal tense beside me. What was going to happen? Where was it going to happen? We rode down the short main street, then hung a left. I took in the rows of houses, imagining the people sleeping inside. Was one of them Stench's target? Was he planning to use the gas to burn down one of these houses? No. Another couple of turns and we were on a much more commercial strip, fast food places, a strip mall with a mini mart, a sporting goods store, parking lot. Stench made a left and parked across the street from the parking lot. Everybody out, he ordered. I noticed he had a paper bag in his hand when he climbed out of the van. Wet splotches had appeared in the paper. I made a point to position myself behind Stench, downward. The gas fumes were coming from the bag. Stench led the way across the street. A high aluminum fence circled the car lot. Stench nodded to Mondo. Mondo pulled a pair of bolt cutters out of the back of his pants. With one snap, the lock fell off the gate. Bondo opened it for us with a bow. Rows of bright colored pennants flapped over our heads. A giant neon sign that read sport utility sale glowed in the showroom window. They weren't kidding. The lot was filled with SUVs, SSRs, Hummers, a Jeep that was probably seven feet wide, even a monster truck that was probably more to attract people to the lot than anything else. Solar Man let out a tortured groan behind me. Petal shook her head. Commercials make you think driving these things are about to go, about going off road, getting back to nature, but they destroy the environment. And no matter how often they say it, they won't hear. And no matter how often we say it, they won't hear, Stench said. No matter how many articles we write, they won't see. He shook his head. Global warming, smog emissions, it, dependence on foreign oil. Einstein wannabe shook his fists in the air. No fossil fuel, no fossil fuel. Stench put his finger to his lips. Einstein wannabe instantly were, were silent. We need to do more than speak and write, Stench continued. We need to save humanity from itself. And the first thing we need to do is get their attention. Stench pulled a damp cloth out of the wet paper, out of the paper bag. I got a strong whiff of gas. He unwrapped the cloth. I saw a coil of rope. I knew instantly what it was for. The rope was a fuse. Stick one end in the gas tank, light the other. The flame would follow the gas soaked rope all the way to the gallons of gas. Then, which of these gas guzzling demons should we should be our victim? Stench asked. I say that one, he pointed to a big red SUV. Mondo, Solar Man, and Wannabe Einstein let out a cheer. Stench started toward the vehicle. I glanced at Joe. I could tell by his face we were in agreement. No way were we letting this happen. Stench, I shouted. He half turned, not looking pleased at the interruption. You think it's wrong to eat anything with a face? You want to live in peace with the entire planet, I called. That's right, Stench answered. Doesn't that include human beings, I demanded. We have faces, Joe added. We live on the earth. Stench jerked his thumb toward the SUV. That is not a human being. Some, human make, some humans uh, makes his living selling it, I answered. Some human will lose thousands and thousands of dollars. To learn a lesson, Stench said. Haven't you been listening? I do care about humanity. I'm trying to save lives. We're all going to die if people don't start listening to Mr. Stench, Einstein wannabe agreed. People have to see the light, Solar Man chimed in. Stench turned back around and strode toward the SUV. Joe nodded at me, and we both launched ourselves at him. 
I hit stench behind the knees with one shoulder. We both went down hard. Stench on the asphalt, me on top of stench. He managed to flip over on his back. He used both feet to kick me in the chest. I flew off him, but shoved myself to my feet a second later. Joe had managed to get one arm wrapped around Stench's throat. He was clawing at Joe's face, but Joe wasn't letting go. I figured it was time to go for the gut. Stench's stomach was vulnerable to attack. I backed up a little to get a little speed going and found myself dangling in the air thanks to Mondo. His arm was like a vice. I tried to execute a roll, but I only moved about an inch. Mondo strolled over to Joe. He snatched him up and stuck him under his other arm. Take them to the van, Stench ordered. Solar man, I, I give you the honor of lighting the fuse. I felt like a sack of groceries. It was humiliating. Mondo wasn't even breathing hard when he dumped Joe and me back into the van. He positioned himself in front of the open door. Less than five seconds later, the others came racing back across the street. They hurled themselves inside. We all stared out the window as the SUV exploded. Chapter 15, Nowhere to Hide, Joe. I'm very disappointed in you too, Stench told Frank and me as he drove away. I thought I could trust you. I stared at the back of his head. How much did I want to get my arm wrapped around his neck again? <laughs> Pretty much more than anything. But Mondo was sitting right next to me, right, right next to him, as usual. Want to take a guess at what, at what was second on my list of wants? If you guessed coming up with a foolproof escape plan, give yourself a, a big gold star. Because now that Frank and I had disappointed Stench, I thought some very unheavenly things were going to happen to us when we got back to heaven. So about the foolproof escape plan, we needed one fast from a van zooming through the desert at about 70 miles an hour. Hmm. My brain was one big blank. I looked at Frank. There didn't seem to be a light bulb over his head either. The, ri the ride back to the compound felt like it took minutes instead of the usual half hour. Think, I ordered myself as we passed the now entering heaven sign. Think. Hardly any time left. I looked over at Frank again. He deliberately moved his gaze to the van's sliding door, and I got it. Behind, uh, Between Frank and me, I was closer to the door. I pretended to tie my shoe and get a little closer. The van slowed down as we reached the rows of tents. I made my move. I yanked open the door and hurled myself out. Pain in my knee, in my shoulder, stand up. I mean, sand up my nose, down my throat. Get them, Stench yelled. A hand grabbed my arm, pulled me to my feet. I peered into the darkness. Frank, it was Frank. We tore down the closet row of tents. No point in ducking into one of them. Almost every tent held the Stench follower, and it wouldn't take the others long to search the dining hall or the lab or the tents that held other supplies. We definitely couldn't go back to the copter tent. Racing out into the desert probably wasn't the smartest move either. It was a death trap with no food or water. I stumbled, went down on one knee, the same one I'd landed on when I jumped out of the van. I found myself staring at a wooden, wooden shovel. I took a moment to look around. We were in the garden. Frank, the compost heap. I whispered. I dashed over to the large heap of vegetable peelings and started to dig with the shovel. Soon we heard other voices. They couldn't have gotten far. Check all the unoccupied tents. We're going to pray. We're going to pay. They're going to pay. Sorry, my eyes are a little bit watery. The voices were getting closer. I dug faster. When I had a, a hole just big enough for Frank and me, we slid in. Slimy vegetables down the shirt. Don't try it. <laughs> There's no place to hide, a guy called. I thought it was Dave. I assume they started back to town. Perhaps they found their bikes, although they would have made noise. That voice was definitely stenches. I'm sure they'll want to tell the police who blew up the SUV. Bikes. Good idea, Frank whispered. He found our bikes. Shoot. We have to go after them. We can't let them go let them get to the authorities, Stench demanded. I heard the sound of footsteps moving away. They're leaving, I said. A piece of old cabbage slid in my mouth. Now what? Frank asked. We can't stay in here forever. I spit the cabbage away from my mouth. I think it's kind of homey, I answered. I thought for a moment. We can't try to find our bikes right now. We only know one road out of here, and we could run right into Stench, Stench and the van. Too bad the helicopter doesn't have a stick, Frank said. From the air, it would be no problem to find our way out of the desert. I thought for another moment. You know what we should do? What? 
Stench and Mondo are both away from the compound, I answered. It's the perfect time to search Stench's house. Chapter 16. Surprise! Frank. Joe and I made a quiet trip to, to our tent for my lock picks. For my lock picks. I was glad I decided to pack them. I wasn't sorry about the clean underwear either. I was pretty sure my current pair was filled with rotten rutabagas. Afterwards, we crept through the dark compound to Stench's house. Joe held a, a micro flashlight for me while I got to work. It's not like there were any street lights or anything. The lock was pretty basic. I stepped inside the house and automatically felt for a light switch, even though I knew I wouldn't find one. Wait, my fingers actually felt a little plastic switch. I hit it. The room flooded with light. Whoa, Joe exclaimed. He walked in and shut the door behind us. This place is not eco-friendly, I finished for him. It wasn't just that Stench's house was wired with ele for electricity. The lines must have been run underground. He had a refrigerator. My eyes darted around the large room. And a TV. And a computer. The latest version. High tech. Joe headed straight for the fridge. He pulled out a couple of bottles of water and tossed me one. I don't know about you, but I swallowed a cup of sand and some slimed out car cabbage. I unscrewed the water, rinsed my mouth, then walked across the room to spit in the sink. Oh man, stench is such a fake. Joe had had his head back in the fridge. Unless they figured out how to make cow, a cow without a face, he has steak in here, hamburger. Let's see if we can find something ATAC will be more interested in, I said. I figured the computer was the, the best place to start. Joe yanked the, the biggest desk drawer free and sat down on the floor with it. Come to Papa, he muttered as he started shifting through the papers. Stench hadn't bothered with the password. I guess he thought the lock on the door and Mondo were security enough. I hit the quicken icon. That program would let, let me see his banking records. How a guy gets and spends his money can be pretty interesting. Oh, sweet, Joe exclaimed. That SUV Stench made Solar Man blow up? It looks like Stench owns it. He waved the pink slip. I don't get it. I said, what was the point? What's the point of all this? I mean, Stench obviously doesn't believe anything he says. Joe shrugged. I turned my attention back to the computer and ran my eyes down a list of deposits and withdrawals. I hit print. Did you find something? Joe asked when he heard the printer cranking up. Oh yeah, Stench has gotten several payments from a company called Patrol International. I told him, big ones. Patrol as in oil? Ooh. Stench had been a bad boy. Joe raised his eyebrows as he scanned the printout. A very bad boy. Turns out it wasn't just that, that SUV he owned. He owned the whole dealership. He's destroying the environment left and right, I said. Hey, I just thought of something. How weird is it that this place didn't get touched when those townies came rampaging through? Pretty strange, Joe agreed. This building kind of stands out. I bet Stench paid them off. For some reason, he wants everyone here whipped into a frenzy. Ready for his plan, whatever it is, Joe said. I grabbed the sheet of paper from the printer, which was right next to the landline phone. The, the phone! Joe, a phone, I burst out. We can get some help. I can't believe. I didn't think of looking for a phone first thing. Joe snatched up the receiver. Drop the phone, Hardy. Chapter 17, Stench's Plan. Joe, I dropped the phone. If I didn't, I figured Stench would order Mondo to pound me into the ground. How do you know our real names? Frank demanded. Right, Stench had called me Hardy. I'd, I'd been so shocked to see him. And Mondo, it hadn't quite registered. Stench walked over to the leather sofa on the other side of the room and sat down. We found your motorcycles in the desert, he answered. Trace the registrations. He waved his hand at Mondo. Mondo stalked toward me and Frank. He reached into the kangaroo pocket of his sweatshirt and pulled out some rope. We know you're not an environmentalist, I told Stench. That rope is very low tech, Stench shot back as Mondo began to tie my hands together. It looks like you boys have been busy, Stench nodded toward his desk. How brilliant am I? The guy's a complete loon, I thought as Mondo tied my feet together. I wouldn't have been surprised if Stench's eyes started twirling like wind turbine, turbines. How brilliant is this place? Stench looked for me to Frank. Oh, you didn't put it together. He shook his head, making a disappointed clucking sound 
with his tongue. Well, I work for an oil company. Patrol International, Frank said. Mondo was tying him up now. And what do I do for them? Well, I'll tell you. I gather up wackos. Stench brought his hand up and began counting off his fingers. Solar Man, my first little wacko. Samuel Fisk, my Einstein-loving wacko. Petal North Star, my little idealistic wacko. Janet Simpkins, my intellectual wacko. Stench smiled up at the ceiling. I'm proudest of bringing Janet here. She might really have come up with something revolutionary. I felt like puking. So you get paid to make sure no one develops a good alternative energy source? You got part of it, Stench said. Oh, you are so sick, Frank burst out. I get the tet. I get the rest. Your job was to encourage these people to do violent things. You wanted them to look bad. You got it. No one wants to listen to people who are throwing paint and blowing stuff up, Stench said. I like you too. You're smart, he added. He pulled out a cigarette and lit up. Too bad I'm going to have to kill you. Gulp? I mean, I don't know what I thought Stench would do to us, but my brain hadn't gotten to murder. And I know exactly when I'm going to do it, Stench told us. Tomorrow, it's Earth Day, or at least close enough. It was a couple of months ago, but because it's my birthday, I've chosen to celebrate Earth Day again with you. He started tapping his toe, then he began to sing the happy birthday song, except half the time he turned it into happy, happy Earth Day, and he made the last line, I'll kill the hardies. Catchy. <laughs> you know what I needed right now? Yeah, a foolproof escape plan. I felt like Frank and I would need to be Houdinis to get out of here. We were both tied up, hand and foot, and Mondo was in taking his eyes off us. I know exactly how I'm going to do it, too, Stench continued. I didn't really want to hear the details of my demise, but knowing what Stench had planned would make it easier to avoid whatever it was, I hoped. It's going to be part of my birthday present to myself. For my birthday, I'm going to blow up a nuclear power plant. He said it like it was nothing, like for his birthday he was going to buy himself a pair of underpants. You're insane, Frank sounded horrified. Oh no, nuclear power is evil. It could destroy the oil industry, Stench answered. I've got, I've got over the plans very carefully. The Diablo power plant is 12 miles from San Luis Obispo. I'm going to crash the drone into it. The drone, right, the helicopter with no stick. Great technology, Stench continued, very similar to what we used in Afghanistan. I can fly it anywhere from the ground. You two will be able to get a, an up-close look, because you'll be inside. He turned to Mondo. Isn't that perfect? Even if the plant doesn't blow, these two will die, and when their bodies are found, they'll be accused of terrorism. A blast of nausea hit me as I imagined the headlines. Imagined Mom and Aunt Trudy reading them. At least Dad would figure out the truth. Stench stood up. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get started. Mondo, would you? For the second time, I found myself pinned under Mondo's meaty arm. He carried me outside and walked me around the building. There he dumped me into a large wooden cart that stood there. The second he stopped away, I, w I started working on the ropes, rubbing them on the edge of the cart. The friction heated up my wrists, but I didn't feel the ropes giving, give it all. I stopped when I saw Mondo carrying Frank toward the cart. He tossed my brother in next to me. Then he pulled us toward the tent with the copter. Stench trailed behind us, humming his birthday Earth Day song. When we reached the tent, Mondo unlaced the flap and pulled it open up open wide. I could see the drone inside, the death machine. Stench pulled the remote out of the pocket of his long white robe. He hit a button and the drone rolled out of the tent. Load it up, Stench cried. He actually clapped his hands like an excited little kid. Mondo grabbed Frank and started toward the drone. Pedal, help, I shouted. She was the only one I could think of who might help us. Might. She liked Frank. Maybe she liked him enough to go against Stench. Pedal, I shouted again. Frank needs you. Like you, Pedal is a little tied up right now. Stench laughed so hard that he snorted. I made a joke. He cried. Your little Pedal is tied up in the desert. Mondo came back for me and tossed me into the, the drone cockpit next to Frank. What do you mean? What did you do to her? Stench walked up the side of the copter. I just did what I had to. I found out Pedal was sneaking information to you, so I had someone tie her up and leave her out in the desert.
She'll die out there, Frank yelled. That's the point, Stench answered. Everyone can't have an exciting, as exciting a death as the one I've prepared for you and your brother. He stepped back and hit a button on the remote. The propeller began to spin. So the note we got telling us to check out Stench's house came from Petal, Frank said. His eyebrows were pulled together. Yeah, she likes you even more than I thought, Ike said. <laughs> that can't be the reason. You don't go against your beliefs because you like someone, Frank answered. The propeller spun faster. Uh, can we talk about pedal situation later? I asked Frank. I think we're about to have liftoff. Not that there was anything to do. If we managed to hurl ourselves out of the copter, Mondo would just shove us back in. Maybe when we drop the remote, drop the remote stench, I twisted around and saw Petal with her bow and arrow. She had an arrow pointed at Stench's head. Get her, Mondo, Stench ordered. Take one step toward me and your boss gets an arrow through the brain, Petal told Mondo. Her voice was cold and harsh, but it turned warm when she got when she called out to Frank, don't worry, I'm gonna get you out of there, Frank. I assumed when she got Frank out, she'd get me out too. I mean, I am his brother, right? <laughs> Dear Petal, 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 Stench crooned. I taught you better than that. I taught you to love all living things. I can love a scorpion, Stench. I can love a rattler, but I can't love you, Petal shot back. She let the arrow fly. It hit a tree six inches away from Stench's head. You know I'm a lot better shot than that. Take take this as a warning. She strung another arrow and pointed it at the center of Stench's forehead. Mondo, untie them. Mondo came toward me with a knife in his hand. Within a second, all the saliva in my mouth had dried up. Thankfully, he used the knife to cut my ropes free. Then Frank's. We burst out of the helicopter. Drop the remote stench, Petal instructed. No. Petal didn't repeat herself. She pointed the arrow downward and shot the remote out of Stench's hand. Get him, Frank shouted. Frank got to Stench first, tackled him. I jumped on his chest using my weight to pin him down. He didn't even struggle. He was staring at something over my shoulder, eyes wide. I couldn't resist taking a quick look. The drone had risen off the ground. Grab it, Mondo, Stench shouted. I punched him in the jaw. You aren't the one giving orders anymore, I told him. Stench suddenly buckled, knocking me half off him. His elbow landed square on my nose, and for a second, all I could see were red dots in front of my eyes. Everything was pain. The second my vision cleared, I managed to grab one of Stench's ears and twist. It doesn't sound like much, but it can really hurt. And it gave Frank the chance to shove Stench over and get one of his hands pinned behind his back. Joe, duck! I, I obeyed Frank without thinking and pressed myself flat against the ground. My hair ruffled as the drone passed above me. I don't know how to work this thing, Petal exclaimed. She jabbed at the remote. I'm trying to make it land. Mondo lunged at her. Petal darted away, still punching the remote's buttons. The copter jerked up, up, and Mondo made another lunge. Then the helicopter slammed into the ground. As it exploded, I was hit with a wave of heat. Stench twisted onto his side. Mondo, he cried out. A human figure staggered out of the fireball. Mondo. He took three steps, then collapsed. Mondo! Stench wailed again, and I realized he was crying. Blood and tears streaked his face. It was over. Chapter 18. Road Trip. Frank. Dave and his dad raced up to us. A few seconds later, Einstein wannabe appeared. His hair was wilder than ever. More people appeared every moment. Before we could answer their questions, we had to deal with the flaming remains of the drone. We quickly formed a, a bucket brigade after tying up Stench. As the buckets of water passed down the line, I couldn't help wondering what would happen to all these people. Janet could probably get a job anywhere, but what about Solar Man? Working together, it didn't take long to put the fire out. Then Joe, Petal, and I gave everyone in the compound as much of an explanation as we could. Not fun. In the background, Stench kept calling us liars, but with the blackened cap door sitting in the compound, most people believed us. After all questions were answered, I felt it was time to wrap this case up. I guess we should go call for... Do you hear that? Joe, un Joe interrupted. I tilted my head down and listened. Was I just having a delayed stress attack, or was I really hearing a real helicopter? I scanned the sky. Sure enough, a copter was incoming. Duck. Ducking, Frank and I ran toward it 
after it had landed, was it one of Stench's oil company bosses? Who else would be showing up here in a helicopter? The answer, our dad. What are you doing here? Joe cried as dad hopped out of the copter. Does that mean you're not happy to see me? Dad asked, just surprised. <laughs> just surprised, I told him. How'd you find us? We barely found this place ourselves. That fireball helped, dad answered. I was in California on a mission. I heard the two of you were out out of cell phone rage and I thought maybe something had gone wrong. I decided to do a flyover. Joe rolled his eyes. He hates it when dad gets overprotective. In this case though, we sort of did need our butts saved, <laughs> sort of. We were just about to call for help, but somehow calling for backup wasn't the same as being rescued by your dad. A little embarrassing. Do you wish I hadn't come? Dad asked, his voice a little sharp. He'd clearly caught the eye roll. No, I answered. Are you kidding? We've been eating tofu for days. We're dying to get out of here. Joe smiled. Yeah, we were just wrapping things up and we needed a lift. And who's this? Dad asked. He jerked his chin toward a pedal. She was doing that hanging back not, but not going away thing. I waved her over. Dad, this is Pedal North Star. This is our dad, Fenton Hardy. I'm Paula Northrub, actually. Pedal or Paula said. Pedal or Paula said. I knew your parents didn't name you Pedal. Joe jumped in. He turned to Dad. This girl saved our lives twice. Dad shook Paula's hands. Then I'm especially glad to meet you. I still don't get why you you were helping us. You're part of the compound, I said. It's because she loves you, Frank, Joe butted in. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I blushed. Paula did too. I was in the com I was in the compound of undercover, Paula said. I'm kind of an amateur detective myself. I lived near here and I wanted to find out what bigger plan Stench might have. And what do your parents think about this? Dad asked. He pretty much had to, being a parent himself. They're cool about it, Paula answered. I'm homeschooled, so I could be out here without messaging, up, without messing up my grades or anything. My parents and I have a lot of trust between us. They know I can take care of myself and I've cracked some pretty intricate cases in these parts before. She smiled at me. At some point, I started to think you were a detective too. I didn't want to blow up my cover, but I wanted to help you out. You mean Frank and me? Joe muttered. Hi, I'm Joe. Have we met? Definitely, Paula said, smirking. You and Frank. She was still looking only at Frank, though. <laughs> anyway, that's why I wrote you the note about Stench's house. Paula shifted awkwardly from foot to foot. Well, I guess you'll be leaving soon. Me too. I should go pack up my stuff. She took a couple of steps away, then hesitated. Frank, Joe whispered. She told you she loves you. She saved your life two times. Give her your email address, you moron. Maybe she was, maybe he was right, I guess. But couldn't we just go home and get to our next case? I stepped up to Paula. My tongue had had done that weird trip, uh, tripling in size thing, but I managed to get out a few sentences. Uh, you wanna keep in touch? That would be cool. She gave me her email, I gave her mine. You know, I probably will write. It's easier to write to girls than talk to them because you don't have to look at them and they can't see you be all dorky. So what was your mission? Joe asked our dad. Top secret co consulting job for a high tech security agency. You should see some of the stuff they have, dad answered. Motorcycles that would put yours to shame. Everything yours has, but with video cameras built right into the handlebars, night vision headlights, tires of a light metal alloy that can't be punctured. Stop, Joe begged. I'm going to be drooling in a second. We have to go look for our bikes, I said. We had to ditch them in the desert and Stench found them. Who knows what he did with them? I guess we might have to fly home, Joe sighed. I'm already, I'd already picked a stop on the way back. There's this mermaid show that really sounded cool. I forgot to mention, the security company did give me a bonus for a job well done, Dad said. Say it, Dad, say it, I silently pleaded. A couple of prototypes for the newest bikes gassed up and in the back of the copter, Dad told us. Joe and I looked at each other, road trip, we yelled. <laughs> and that was the end. Thank you all for listening.